The following program is brought to you by Element 14, the electronics community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com slash presents. Welcome back to the Electronics Inside, the show where we tear down toys, tools and appliances just to find out what's inside. I'm David and in this video we're going to be doing James and Workbench Wednesdays proud by tearing down a nice vintage oscilloscope. The first thing I have to say about this oscilloscope is it's broken. I would never attempt this on anything quite this nice that still worked. And this is evident from RF Lab B42, US. For anybody that doesn't know, US is unserviceable, although it makes me think of something else every time I hear art. Um, now, the problem was diagnosed as no focus, and JFO is the initials of the engineer that found this fault and 16th of October 2008. So this has been 12 years since this was last used in active operation. And since then it's just sat there, not used. And it was an old bit of kit anyway. I think this had been around since the 80s. So it had, um, had sort of 25-ish years of active life. And you know, that's, that's, that's a reasonable innings for a nice bit of kit. But uh, let's just have a bit of a quick tour. Let's get the handle out of the way, or the stand, whichever way you want to look at it. Now the model number on this is a Tektronix 2213A, which is a 60 megahertz scope. And it's a proper analog scope. Now one thing I have to say right off the back that I really love about this is that sticker on the back. Was there an alternative? Could you get an x-ray from an old tube TV? That's alarming, wouldn't you say? So yes, I don't have any fear of breaking this and as far as I'm aware this hasn't been plugged in for 10 years so I'm not even worried about any capacitors. That said, I wouldn't be surprised to find some leaky ones in there. So let's get inside. Now I'm not going to embarrass myself by trying to talk through the functions and features on this scope because I'm pretty sure a lot of people watching this video will know this a lot better than I will. I have used scopes, can use scopes, do use scopes. I feel like my process is very haphazard and ad hoc. If you want good advice on how to use lab equipment, definitely head over to Wench Wednesdays where James will tell you everything you need to know. Suspiciously loose screws as well. I think the engineer that uh, wrote this off may have had a look himself to see if he could fix it. I'm sure actually there are some calibration pots in here as well, which would have needed regular maintenance. I know it does. Just was being too much of a wimp with it. There you go, that's the case and the handle. Oh yes, look at that proper engineering. See, I think this thing's as old as me and I still want to say, they don't make them like that anymore. So nice caged power supply at the back, I'm going to assume. There's like aluminium shield. This is obviously the cathode ray tube. Right, I, I'm sure it, most people are familiar with this, but anybody that isn't, we're just briefly going to cover. On a TV screen, an old CRT or tube TV screen, you have magnets which scan the V-electron beam across it and down to draw the picture sequentially. And you're not quite doing pixels, but you're receiving a signal which generates the black and white or color image as it scans along. What you're allowing the scope to do is let the time base control how quickly the beam scans across the tube. And you allow your signal to control the uh, x-axis of the, the picture. And what that does is when you get a repeating wave, you get this nice repeating solid image that you can look at and that allows you to diagnose or understand signals that are being generated. So we, when we've looked at CRTs in the past and if you want to see me mess around with a CRT that I'm actually worried about might be live, um, go look at the iMac G3 video and you get a beautiful demonstration of some of the high voltage electronics required there. It's interesting, this one says CRT anode voltage 7 kV. Now, when you're getting an x-ray from a doctor, the x-ray power is measured in kilovolts. And a typical medical x-ray, I think, is about 40 kV. Uh, a dental x-ray is about 20 kV. So, yeah, there's, there's some significant 
energy going through here. And when they said on that back here about the X-ray emissions, uh, I would imagine that's what this big cone-shaped shielding is. And this port on the back, I would imagine is sort of diagnostics for the high voltage output. So you don't have to disassemble and remove the entire tube or the CRT to be able to diagnose what issues may be. You can just plug a diagnostics or even external inputs onto the tube. As I said, this has been off for approximately 12 years, did we say? So I'm not worried about any residual charge. Anything that's not dissipated in this time, well, good luck to it. Diffuser for the screen. Oh, cool. There you go, there's the CRT. That's your X-ray shielding. There you go. There is the CRT. And there's something about this that's just so fantastically analog that you can see all the connectors, the glass. These must have been so hard to manufacture to repeatable precision. They're just absolutely stunning. So I'm very interested by this really long coil of wire here. It appears to be two core and screened, but it's, you've got loads of it, frankly. So where on the bottom does that disappear to? So it's just two cores from there, brought up round the back, around the back of the high voltage connections, down to the front. In fact, no, they're not the same place, but they're so incredibly close on the top and bottom side of that board. You almost kind of have to question why you would bother. So, shall we see if we can get the power supply cover off next? Now, I will say, as a precision high cost item, I don't mind the use of different screws and connectors on this because you're not going for speed of assembly, you're going for precision and high quality. This was always going to be handmade, so I don't resent the fact that you have to use 10 different screwdriver bits. So, even the aluminium's got this discoloration sort of sooty. Although I'm, I don't think it actually is soot or anything from arcing, I imagine that's probably just it's almost like powder coating where sort of the electromagnet, because this says uh, 100 volts DC running through it. And I imagine that that constant charge is just attracting charged particles that settle on the bits of aluminium as dust. Probably stick there when they get hot. Ah. Okay, to switch on the scope, you've got this little black button right at the front here. But the power switch is right over here at the back. You've just got this really long linkage. It goes all the way down. Oh, and even weirder, you can even see the latch. You can just see that little metal spring. Ooh, I'll show you how big my finger is by comparison. Right down the middle there. Watch as it goes in one way to latch, then out the other way to release. So the actual latching is done by that tiny little hook of wire. You can just see in the plastic underneath, the little heart-shaped run that it runs down. Okay, so this side you've got all the power supply, so that's generating the high voltages. See the size of the capacitors in there, that, that's going to be nasty, you definitely don't want to be poking around in there. We've got something with a very nice big heat sink which dissipates heat to the outside edge. Now, that's a bit funny because although it's dissipating to a solid piece of aluminium, it's got these tiny little vents on the side. So this one would have been either side of that place. It's not gonna get a huge amount of heat dissipation through there. So all of these little pots and settings down here are gonna be for setting up the maximum minim minimums, calibrations and trims. Because this is a precision machine, you can use this to take measurements on time between trigger and response. You need it to be calibrated to be exact. If you need to set a trigger or, or a timer in response to, or tune a circuit in response to what you're measuring on your scope, it has to be right, otherwise it will never work. 
so these will be regularly calibrated. Okay, you remember I said about the power switch that goes all the way to the back? Well, the focus knob, which is this one here, actually runs on this grey shaft all the way back to a giant potentiometer here. And I wonder if actually some contact cleaner in there might just fix this without needing to do anything electronic to fix it. That would be kind of cool. Okay, so let's start taking off some of these, freeing up the input board at the front. I'm trying to keep these connection wires as clear sort of as to where they went as I can. So when I come to putting them all back together, it's not too much of a mystery. So let's take the RF shield off. Well, I'm not sure that really is an RF shield. It's the labels, I guess. Ooh, rotary encoders. Did not see that coming. So you see these drums, you've got detent at the back with the little crenellated uh, cog-like backs. And then you've got all these little, uh, like a music box almost. So underneath these, you're gonna see a series of springs, little switches that make and break as you rotate this and it m sort of opens and closes a series of switches. Okay, that board was the timing board. So this changes the, the time base. So the seconds per division. And underneath massive ground plane and just your timing segments on this lovely rotary switch. So I obviously know that there are BNC connectors that have got their locking rings on the back, but I don't see how that would have been the order of assembly. And it's more likely that actually these were soldered in place. So those, those they're actually on resistors. Those resistor legs were sort of poked up and soldered in, in situ. I don't know. I hope this doesn't descend into a remove all the screws and hope for the best type teardown. I always like to be a little more controlled than that if I can be. Of course it really works like that, but never mind. No, of course they didn't do it that way around because they screwed the BNCs onto this, slotted it in, and then sold the resistors on the back. Of course they didn't assemble it in this way. It's only my reluctance to desolder the resistors that is causing this to be much more painful than it needed to be. When really I should have just desoldered it really. Because I'm still gonna have to do that if I wanna get this case apart properly soldering line time. So all I'm going to do is desolder the little solder cups on the back of the BNC connectors, which I really should have just admitted defeat and done a long time ago. Just warming up the iron, a little bit of flux just to get things going. So BNC, BNC and BNC, which like I say, I've done in totally the wrong order. And actually, in reality, they would have fitted these to the faceplate and soldered them on after. Okay, got the two resistors from the channel one and channel two input where I desoldered the BNC connectors just on the solder pots there. Interesting that the, uh, when I said this has a C13 socket on the inside, or, uh, sorry, C13 plug, because this is actually male, but it's also an EMC filter. So that's actually a power filter to make sure that you don't get any horrible waveforms or harmonics coming in and affecting your scope readings. They've just done such a nice job of actually putting the wires through the holes, wrapping them around and then soldering them on. The wire's almost soldered to itself and the lug, which I think lovely for a high quality piece of equipment. Not so good for me. Starting to see why when the, this scope went out of focus at the end of its life, nobody went, oh, I'll repair that. Oh, come on, 1980s technician. Why did you have to do such a good job? Right, is that everything? Yay! Say what you like. Old Tektronix scopes built to last. I find it really fascinating that this board is actually soldered all of these little pin connectors. I would have made that as an assembly, but 
then again, I guess that's just another mechanical joint which can fail and introduce errors because this is where all your calibration or your setup comes in. And it all goes through these pins. If you had sort of the 2.5 inch headers with pins on them, they wouldn't be as reliable. You'd then worry that they would move and lose contact and you get noise on your signals, which you just can't have in a scope. I'm still a little bit intrigued by these. I mean, they're marked positive and negative. They're in a shielded coaxial, uh, 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 shielded and grounded cable that run all the way up, round a long loop, and then back onto the board. I don't know why you would have done that. It obviously goes round the back of the tube, so that coil of wire would have sat about there, but I'm not sure why. I can't, I, I don't know. If you know, head over to the comment section on the Element 14 community and let me know there. Yeah, I'm really baffled by that. So this plug on the back had all the connections for the tube. So you can see all those pins on the back there. We've gone into this plug. And as I said, you can debug or even feed in external signals into this. Could have played Vectrex on there, maybe? <laughs> and all of these signal wires from here. So I'm guessing over here, you've got sort of the control for the, the gates and maybe the focus. Yeah, because the focus is this pot just here. Remember, it had that really long shaft which went right away from the front. Uh, see that little kind of ring on there? That actually corresponds with the edge of this wire, which is the cathode? No, anode for the tube. That's, that's the only thing I can point out in this entire thing that looks like sort of poor design. And even that's stretching it a little bit. So yeah, all those signals I would think are high voltage for the uh, the electron source, the electron gun. Just trying to remember, there wasn't anything else. No, nothing else that could have qualified for that. Obviously the focus, which is associated with the electron gun and the initial choke. And then these ones, I'm gonna guess are your signal because they come sort of through a different path. And the labeling on this board is awesome. CRT base pins, it's just, a lovely, lovely, well laid out board. Level, PP level, slope, trigger sense. So each section of the board is broken up and laid out with silk screen, telling exactly what it does. So you've got your triggers, your delays, slope and balance. Oh, we were gonna have a look at some of the rotary encoders on here, these, these things that almost look like music boxes. Let's, let's have one of these off and just see if we can find anything cool. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Super cool. All these 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. 16 different switches. As you rotate this into different positions, you've got this detent at the back. It's like a music box and they just depress the different springs in sequence. So there's no switching that's done electronically, it's all mechanical. And all of the little ICs down here, I think are gonna be really TTL type equipment. So it's just gonna be transistor to transistor logic. There's not gonna be any processing. It's all gonna be packaged transistors and, and op amps and things like that. And it just goes to show the engineering. Somebody had to sort of really think about the path of everything here. You're not just, having inputs and outputs from a, a, a microcontroller that have to go through an op amp first. And it's kind of funny to me that you've got this huge box and it's actually not a lot of space occupied by it. There's a huge amount of heat dissipation around the power supply, which goes inside this shield. But actually, by the time you've got these two boards, this and the CRT in there, still a lot of free space. I think this is a bit more of a niche one because I've not gone into the detail of work, how the machine works and I probably haven't revealed much to anybody that didn't already know how a scope works. But the quality and the high precision nature of the manufacturing here is what makes this a cool teardown. And if you want to know more about scopes and equipment and lab equipment, head over to Workbench Wednesdays and James will sort you out completely. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this one. I found it absolutely amazing just to see inside it's something this high quality. If you've got an idea for a teardown, why don't you head over to the Element 14 community and let me know. It's at element14.com forward slash the electronics inside. Thank you so much for joining me. 
I'll see you next time. So this is the, the high voltage plug for the back of the CRT. Um, so you could either hot swap it or do diagnostics on it. Um, it kind of reminds me of something and I just can't quite place it. Maybe it had a whitish blue glow behind it. <laughs>